Our next speaker is Dr. Shai Botan. He is MSU Foundation Professor, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Michigan State. Dr. Tan's talk is titled Making Sense of Water and will explain how MSU researchers are exploring the use of sensor-rich rich robofish for observing natural waters, from measuring temperature, mapping harmful algae, and even stalking invasive species. You'll see some of the technology in action, learn the challenges, and hear Dr. Tan's perspective on how robotics is shaping our understanding of water. Please welcome Dr. Shai Botan. Thank you. Good afternoon, Robofish. Let's greet the audience. Wave your right hand, a thing. Left thing. Wiggle the tail. See, it can make a perfect pet. Thank you, Maria. Oh, Maria is now the name of the robot fish. She's my PhD student controlling the fish right there. But Grace is actually a robot fish. Grace, technically speaking, is a gliding robotic fish. It has a tail that allows her to, I should say, she has a tail that allows her to swim forward. Uh, but also, she utilizes gliding motion to move around. Now, for those of you who do not or who are not very familiar with gliders, I can make one at the cost of one penny and I show you how it works. Literally, one penny. So, this is my son's swimming lessons reporting card, which I stole last night. If I drop it, I'll let it go. It drops like rock, almost. But if I put a penny and then drop, it goes there. So what you just observe is that this piece of paper traveled horizontally under gravity. Now, if we can play the video, this is basically the gliding of grace. Uh, in action. So you would think, first of all, why do we need gliding? And that's motivated by our purpose of using these robots as underwater drones uh, in the water environment. So we want them to be very, you know, we'll operate in the field for a long time. Inside the robot, there is basically a moving mass a movable mass, so when I want the robot to go down, the mass is moved forward. So you pitch, just pitch the robot like this, and then we pump water in, then the water, uh, the robot will sink, but when it sinks, just like this travels, right? And when you want to reverse the motion, you move the mass inside backwards, so the robot is like this, and you pump water out, so the robot rises, but it's not like rise like that, but it's rise forward. So that's the principle of underwater glider. And with this, you move the robot basically with gravity or buoyancy, which is very energy efficient. So comparing to underwater gliders like these, the robots that we make are quite lightweight. So you look at John Thun here, he's carrying it. It's 20, 30 pounds, and you can deploy in water from the shore, as opposed to for these big underwater gliders, you will have two or three people and uh, with a boat or a vessel. Uh, so this allows us really to look at all kinds of different sensing applications. Now, with the cost of one big underwater glider, you can have maybe 10, 20 of these small robots, maybe one for your backyard, one for the swimming pool. And so that's the idea. So what can we use? these robots for. And Dr. Rose just talked about algal blooms. So let's first look at algal blooms. And this is the picture of Lake Erie, very typical picture during the summer. And these harmful algae, they release toxins, so making water not drinkable. If you recall a few years ago, residents of uh, Toledo were advised not to drink water from the tap because of that. And 
algae, these harmful algae suck up oxygen from water, fish will die. And of course, beach will be closed, hotel will lose business. And uh, of course, you cannot wait until things are getting so bad, say, okay, now let's do something. And we would like to find this, predict or monitor and predict ahead of time. But if you look at what causes the al algal blooms, basically this is actually bacteria uh, called a cyanobacteria. And this is a microscopic view of the microcystis, um, one kind of cyanobacteria uh, taken by my colleague, Elena Lichman. And you will see they are not green, or they're not totally green, right? They have actually blue-greenish color, but it's mostly trans translucent kind of color, uh, which is not easy to detect when it's at a relatively low concentration. So they will typically go out to the lake once a week or twice a week, and then at a particular location, put the, uh, the equipment in to monitor the concentration of the cyanobacteria and along with some other conditions like temperature uh, and other variables. But they can only afford to go to one place because it just takes so much manpower to do it at all, cover, all different places. But it's notorious. It is known that uh, these algal blooms are, they are distributed in a very different way at different spots. We call it spatial, temporal, uh, heterogeneity, okay, because just different, very patchy. So we said, okay, let's use, thankfully, it looks like this is gonna work. Uh, let's, let's use grace to do the job because grace can move around, look at different places. If we can play the uh, video. So this is at the Window Green Lake, Michigan. And the graduate students and undergrad students get paid by taking field trips. So here we all send the robot to look at different water columns. A water column is like basically a column stretched from water surface down to the bottom. And here, here goes Grace. And now it's actually approaching target. And we can look at everything from the computer. And at some point, the target is reached. I don't know whether you can hear. Uh, there's a sound of my student, Alsama, saying target reached. And then the robot will start to dive. And it's gone, and after a while, like 40 seconds or one minute, it come up and send data. So we looked at a f this particular day, uh, 20 water columns, and what you will see will be a map like this. So for each water column, you see the differences from top to the bottom, the concentration is different. But more importantly, if you compare different columns, they also look different, which is some information that otherwise, you know, if you use traditional practice, wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't uh, be able to get this kind of information. So that's one example of using these robots to gather information, not dynamically, but especially uh, in a distributed manner. So the second example is to use such robots to track, for example, invasive species of fish. Um, if I can know the movement of a fish like sea lamprey, which is probably the number one concerning invasive species for Great Lakes. And then I can set up traps at the right places or uh, put, put in place right mechanisms for, for controlling such species. But how do you do it? So the way to track a fish, uh, one, at least one way of doing it is called acoustic telemetry. You put a spy device inside the fish. Okay, that look, looks very painful, but it's okay. And you suture it up and release the fish back to water. And then you would like to use a so-called acoustic receiver to listen to this spy device. So this spy device will emit sound periodically. And you would like to hear it. If you hear it, which means the fish is nearby. When I say nearby, it's like 500 meter to one kilometer. Now, typically people use stationary receivers placed on shore to detect the presence of such tacked fish. But Clearly, there are a few problems or limitations. One is, if the fish swims into the open lake, you basically wouldn't be able to have access to such information. And number two is, with such receivers, you, you get the information of absence or presence of the fish within my detection 
radius, which is, again, 500 meter to one kilometer. Not very precise, not to mention, okay, precisely tracking the movement. So um, if we can play this video. So the idea here is to use a robot, we call Grace 2.0, which is right here, actually, uh, to serve as a mobile acoustic receiver to track such robots, or to, such, to uh, track the fish. And if you look at this robot, it has multiple sensors. The acoustic receiver would be mounted here. Today it's taken off, but this is also a uh, dissolved oxygen sensor. This is a uh, light sensor. On the other side, we have a uh, chlorophyll sensor and a harmful algae sensor. So it has different kind of a, a suite of sensors along with acoustic receiver to track, uh, uh, detect and track fish movement. Isn't it graceful? So that's, there's a reason we call it grace. So the, some of the field experimental results here, and here we put a, just to test whether, you know, with such a new configuration, these acoustic receivers will still be able to detect uh, the, the spy device, right? So we put a spy device here, and then let the robot run different trajectories. And when you see the red dots, that means that spot, there was acoustic signal sent and detected, right? And of course, there are some other spots we missed the detection. But we were very encouraged by the current preliminary results. It shows that the robot is able to pick up a lot of such detections. Of course, we still have to uh, uh, further refine it. And so I just kind of give you a very quick overview of what we have done in terms of developing and using such robots for gathering information, making sense of the water. And it's not always happy moments. We have a lot of down moments and very sad moments. When we drop the robot from the car to the concrete floor, when things get burned. Um, and next step is to have a group of these robots really collaborating on the water, like, for example, like GPS network, so that folks track things very precisely. And also, they can do a lot of collaborative work among themselves to track or cover a large area simultaneously. And really, I think this technology can be utilized along with other technologies, including aerial drones, satellites, buoys, and underwater gliders. And the key is really put information together. And the final, really, I think a key thing is to go from data to information to knowledge. It's not just about go there, OK, and collecting data. And how would you utilize the information or data you collect to find a solution, to find an answer? For example. What does it tell me, you know, by looking at all the data we collected for algal blooms, what conditions would promote the growth of algal bloom or development of algal blooms? And what, at what time we should take kind, what kind of actions? So translating the data to information, to knowledge, to policy, into action, I think that's the, uh, the key step. Finally, I want to acknowledge many students who have contributed to this work, this totally incomplete list and collaborators from computer science, electrical engineering, but also environmental science, uh, aquatic ecology, and many other different disciplines, and also uh, people who fund us. Thank you very much. I wonder if you could comment on why it's important for robofish to behave in a fish-like manner as opposed to outfitting them with a rudder and a propeller. Very good question. So uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, of course, fish swims uh, in water. That's their environment. And they are really adapted for very high uh, hydrodynamic efficiency. So to some extent, uh, we are we kind of using this as a way of improving the locomotion efficiency. Uh, their propellers would have problems such as you could, you could, you could suck in you know, debris and sometimes live fish into the structure, which is not good for the robot. Uh, even worse for the fish that's sucked in. 
Um, for some applications like tracking live and fish species, we would like to minimize sort of the impact on, on the environment. You don't want to have a monster there trying to stalking the, the fish, but if they see maybe, if, you know, they wouldn't take that as cost specific, but maybe something that they're more familiar with, they feel more comfortable. These are just a, a few kind of possible, uh, I would say, motivations. I'm, I'm curious about how the fish actually move. Are they able to move autonomously, or is it always controlled by a human? Uh, they can move autonomously. Actually, the, uh, the data we collect from Yeah, so there, actually, we're doing autonomous navigation. You type, you put in, you put in the coordinates, and the fish will uh, actually, this gliding fish will figure out a way of getting there and with a combination of swimming and a gliding that we, uh, we talked about. Um, with regards to distance the fish can go, um, what are we looking at with regards to how far they can go, how much they can map, and what is the future with regards to how far they can go. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, maybe a related point is really how long the robot can operate in water. Uh, we have not really done kind of ex uh, this kind of endurance, uh, endurance test, but my, uh, my kind of the best guess would be operating in the environment for a couple of weeks uh, with um, smarter power management and other, uh, and other algorithms. And uh, we were looking at maybe uh, tens of kilometers of range typically for, of course, it's not like total distance, but you know, kind of covering that kind of range. Which is slightly different from like underwater, or not underwater, like ocean gliders. They could travel a thousand kilometers over and, and half a year. Um, but for these smaller robots, I, I know we're more thinking of a smaller range, but more ver versatile environments like not just coastal water, but rivers, uh, small ponds, and streams, inland lakes, gray lakes. Shabotan, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.